Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you out here this morning. Uh, we're still rejoicing over uh, Passion Week previously and uh, trying to continue to wrap our minds and keep our minds focused upon the resurrection as part of uh, why we're here to begin with, why we're alive at all. Why else would we be here if there was no resurrection? Why else would we be here if God didn't draw us all together as, as believers uh, to worship Him? But we are here today. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to be back in Acts today. Acts 14 is where we pick back up at. We stopped there a few weeks ago uh, as we dealt with uh, some, some things of dealing with the resurrection, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. Today we find our place back in here because... As we remind ourselves, after the resurrection, uh, Jesus gave, some days later, he gave them the great commission to take out to a lost and dying world uh, the gospel, the message of salvation. And they did that. Evangelism is what it's called, the spreading of God's word. Well, we look at this passage when we remind ourselves where we were at the end of chapter 3. Paul and Barnabas had been chosen and sent out and uh, Paul and Barnabas found themselves there in Antioch and they preached to the Jews and, and such, they preached to, to the, and there at the Sabbath in the synagogue and they preached to the Gentiles who were there too. And during that whole week, they evangelized that town of Antioch. Uh, well, the following Sabbath, I mean, the whole town showed up. And it was an amazing set of events and, and people were coming to faith in Christ and it, this caused an uproar in the city for those who didn't believe and didn't want to believe. And so they created a riot and a mob and drove Paul and Barnabas out of the city. Well, now they find themselves in the city of Iconium. So let's stand and read uh, part of this together. Acts 14, verse number 1. In Iconium, they entered the Jewish synagogue as usual and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they stayed there a long time and spoke boldly for the Lord to testify to the message of His grace by enabling them to do signs and wonders. But the people of the city were divided, some siding with the Jews and others with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to mistreat and stone them, they found out about it and fled to the Laconian towns of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding countryside. There they continued preaching the gospel. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We ask now that you'd bless your word, and God, put your words into our mouth to give to your people. Uh, just bless each one who's here. Strengthen us. Equip us to preach the gospel. Equip us to share the gospel. Equip us to live out the gospel, Father. Help us to be united in you, to be united with each other in the furtherance of the gospel message. And again, if there's anybody here lost, Father, draw them to you today. And we pray these things in Christ's name. And amen. You may see, may God bless his word this morning. Um, Paul and Barnabas displayed the power of God by signs and wonders. Now, we can, we can spend a lot of time on signs and wonders trying to figure out what those were, how those worked. Uh, were they miracles? Probably. Were they signs of healing? Probably. Uh, were they raising the dead? Maybe. We don't know. I think if Paul had raised somebody from the dead, uh, it would be mentioned. But they're doing signs and wonders of some type of fashion or form. And these signs and wonders, instead of leading to people to a huge amount of worship and praise, it leads to division. It leads to division. It leads to unity, division, but it also it led to persecution. Now, we wouldn't... When we, when we share the gospel, we don't think we're going to be persecuted. We don't think about that. We don't think about it causing division. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 10, and I'm going to turn there and read just a little bit of it. If I can get my place turned there. Matthew 10, uh, Jesus spoke about persecutions being, uh, that were going to come upon them. In verse 16 of Matthew 10, Look, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as serpents and as innocent as doves. Beware of them because they will hand you over to local courts and flog you in their synagogues. You will even be brought before governors and kings because of me to bear witness 
to them and to the Gentiles. But when they hand you over, don't worry about how you how or what you are to speak, for you will be given what to say at that hour, because it isn't you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father is speaking through you. You read on in that passage, it says, Brother will betray brother to death, and father his child. Children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You'll be hated by everyone because of my name, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to another, for truly I tell you, you will not have gone through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. And this is Jesus speaking there when he sent them out two by two uh, to go to these towns before he himself would go to those towns as well. Now here he is, gone in heaven. Now Paul and Barnabas, notice there's two of them. They're still going out two by two. There's some others with him as well, probably traveling along, but Paul and Barnabas are the two main ones, and there they are. Evangelism is continuing, but so did the persecution. Persecution continues too. Jesus said it would happen. Jesus said it would happen, and there it is happening. We look in our world today, and persecution seems to be on the rise against believers and around the world, not just in... Uh, foreign nations, but even here in, in places around our nation as well. So first off, we want to give you a thought today. The gospel has results. The gospel has results. There are results to the gospel. Now, some are good. Some are bad. They have result. It has results, though. When we think about results, when you're given a, a t- when you take a test... You want to know what the result of that test was, whether it be a health test or a school test. How did I do? Did I pass? Did I fail? What were my numbers, right? You go get your blood pressure checked. What is it? How high are my numbers? How low are my numbers? What are they? You know, all these other things. We we want the results of it. We find the first result here, we find in in Iconium, the gospel resulted in unity and division. When we look at them, they go there and they go to the synagogue as usual on the Sabbath day and they preach, they teach, they share the gospel. And it spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believe. Look at that, what God did. God united in that moment in town, in that moment in time, in Iconium, he brought Jews and Gentiles together into the faith, into the family of God, united forever. Those Jews and Gentiles who believe that day are in heaven today because they believe the gospel. It's amazing. It's great. It's awesome when you think about that. This outpouring of salvation brought these two groups of people together who used to be at odds over many issues. But here they've been brought together. What's the gospel done for us? It's brought us together as a body of believers. Because uh, we, we've shared this, and it's been very recently too. If it wasn't for Jesus, I wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here either. You'd be doing your own thing somewhere else. There'd be no church here if it wasn't for Jesus. But look what he's done, how good he's been, how much he's given us by bringing us together as a body of believers. We feed off him, of course. We feed off the word of God. But isn't it great to feed off each other too? Draw a little strength, draw a little courage, draw a little help, encouragement from each other. It's great. It's awesome. We find, though, also but the unbelieving Jews, and I really appreciate the CSB putting that word correctly in there, the unbelieving Jews. Other translations sometimes leave it out. Some other will stick other words in there. These are the unbelieving Jews that get all agitated and stirred up. These are the ones who won't let go of the law, won't let go and give themselves over to Jesus being the Messiah. Well, they stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. They begin to blaspheme Paul and Barnabas, begin to speak bad things about them. Now, they're just here for your money. They're just here for that. They're just here for this. You can't trust those guys. Uh, They used to be, uh, Paul used to be a Pharisee. Look at him, he's been discarded. He's been disgraced. He's been excommunicated from the pharisaical order. He ain't no good. Don't listen to him. I can only imagine the things that they said about them. Has anybody ever talked bad about you? Admit it? Or lied about it? Anybody who speaks bad about some of you, 
Some of you, I leave one person out, and I ain't going to tell you who he is, but you know who I'm talking about. I'm just joking. Just joking. Okay. Anybody who speaks bad of you probably really doesn't know you. Probably doesn't. Now, we've been together, many of us have been getting together for a long period of time. And, and you know the good about me, and you know some of the bad about me. And vice versa, I know some of the good about you, you know some of the bad about you too. The bad about you doesn't make me love you any less. The bad about me, I hope he doesn't make you love me any less either. Because there's good and bad in both of us, right? We're still in our fleshly bodies, right? If you came to Sunday school this morning, you'd have known that. Okay, we talked about it. We're still in our fleshly bodies, okay? We still have this temptation to sin and do bad things. We have to choose not to, though. But what has God done for us? God's united us in faith, even with all our badness. He brings us together, and we glean all the good that we can. Herb spoke high praise about Dorinda, and Dorinda deflects that praise not to herself. She don't, she don't live off that praise. She deflects that back to the glory of God. And when you, you do the same thing for us, we do the same thing for you. When, when we're praised for doing a good thing or whatever, we want God to get the glory for that. We want God to be praised for that. Because he's the one who's given us these good things that's brought us together. We find the division, though. These unbelieving Jews stirred the Gentiles and poisoned their minds. It divided them. Divided them against the others. Many of us have family members that are divided against the other group. You know, they may have one, you may have one radical uncle or one radical cousin or whatever. I don't, I don't whichever, you know who I'm talking about. They're, they're just, they're out there. They're, they're against anything that your family's doing. They stir up trouble every time they come on the scene. I've used the term here before. You, when they're around, you're always walking on eggshells. Let me know how many times you crack an eggshell when you walk on it, okay? You, you, there's always this, this turmoil when they show up. Do you love them less because of that? Sometimes you do. They make it hard to love them. Let me remind you, the gospel was being presented to those who believed and those who didn't believe. God loves those who believe. We know that, right? God also loves those who don't believe. He still loves them. He still died for them. So those family members, we've all got them, that causes turmoil. God loves them, and we're to continue to love them in the name of Jesus in hoping that God can change them. Right? I mean, that's why we have to look at it. Paul, I, I can only imagine. I mentioned Paul being in the pharisaical order. When he came back on the scene, after being gone for some time, after being on the road to Damascus and meeting Jesus, when he came back on the scene preaching the gospel, you know those Pharisees that he had served with, man, they were aghast at what he was doing. I mean, they were had to have been just, I bet some of them passed out on the side of him when they heard him speak because they used to know who he was. They used to know what he stood for, what he spoke about. And now he's doing completely opposite of that, but with the same fervor as he had before. He caused division. Jesus said, I'm coming to divide. I'm going to divide mother against daughter-in-law, father against son. I'm going to come divide. Why? The gospel brings unity, but it also brings division. It's a sad truth, but not everybody is going to believe the gospel. It's sad. Not everybody's going to believe it. Why? I, I don't know. I, I can't find anything better to believe in than the gospel. There's nothing better to believe in. Secondly, after unity and division, the gospel has results in bringing out signs and wonders. So they stayed there in verse 3 a long time and spoke boldly for the Lord and testified to the message of his grace by enabling him to do signs and wonders. Now, we, we read through verse 7 there 
As you skip down into verse 8, after they leave Iconium, they go to Lystra. And Lystra, a man, verse 8, was sitting who was without strength in his feet, had never walked, and had been lame from birth. He listened as Paul spoke. After looking directly at him and seeing that he had faith to be healed, Paul said in a loud voice, Stand up on your feet. And he jumped up and began to walk around. Woo! Is that not amazing? This is in a synagogue, man. This is in a, a programmed synagogue meeting. They came and they would sing some songs that were... Pro, not, program is not the word I'm looking for, but anyway, God, you know what I'm talking about. As you, they're, they're, they come out normally. It's something that would be rehearsed over and over and over again for them to say. They would also read a rehearsed passage of Scripture and stay on track throughout the law, some of the prophets and the Psalms. This would be the same thing they did every synagogue meeting. Paul and Barnabas show up on the scene. We got two visitors in the, in the synagogue today. Do you have anything you'd like to share? Because Paul and Barnabas would probably have asked permission to speak that day when they went in. And when they were given permission to speak, out came the gospel. And while he's there, Paul finds out or sees this man who has never walked. Paul sees him, and read how the scripture reads again. He listened as Paul spoke. After looking directly at him and seeing that he had faith to be healed, Paul said in a loud voice, stand up on your feet. Who gave this man faith to believe in what Paul was preaching? Jesus did. Jesus gave him the faith. He gave him the faith to believe the gospel. Now, Paul tells him to stand up on his feet. How did Paul know that man had faith? You can ask him when you get to heaven. Okay? God had to reveal that to Paul. The same way God revealed that to Paul, to to Peter and John when they went in the temple that day and a man lame outside the temple was there. Peter and John said, we don't have any gold or silver, but what we have we'll give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk. And he did. Same way with Jesus, the man blind from birth. Well, who sinned, Jesus, this man or his parents? Nobody did. He was born this way to bring glory to God. And he opened his eyes and made him see. The signs and wonders have always been a part of the gospel. Paul and Barnabas performed these signs by the power of God to display that God was with them. Many believed because of these miracles. Many believed. But the people, verse 4, the people of Iconium were divided. Some sided with the unbelieving Jews and some sided with the apostles. Now these people, this is crazy what are these guys doing here. Same thing happens, verse 11. When the crowd saw what had been done, they shouted, saying in the Laconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the town, brought bulls and wreaths to the gates because he intended with the crowds to offer sacrifice. Unity? <laughs> Uh Uh-uh, not in the gospel, but unity in a false religion, division. Now, I almost brought this long, detailed note I found about this passage, and I didn't bring it. I want to try to summarize it as best they could. I can. Zeus, not Zeus and Apollo from Magnum P.I., if you know who those dogs were. If you're maybe too young, you may not know who they are, but Zeus and Hermes... Greek gods that had supposedly came down into this town, gave the town a reason to do something, they didn't do it, so they all died, and then for them to satisfy their whatever, they built a temple to them. There's a whole lot more in the note, and that's a bad summary, I know, but all it is is human imagination. You know, I can go home today 
And I can write probably a thousand word essay, make it up on the fly, and create a false image of a false God. Just on a, I can do this. I can come up with a weird name and, and speak all this back about him, make it up, and it not be real, but it might make some people believe it. Some people believe that you could walk up to a door of the store and do this and it open. It's not you doing that. It's the censor on the door doing it. You ain't got nothing to do with that other than that you're there. You may think you have power, but if, you've got Je- if you don't have Jesus, you've got nothing. Nothing. You're divided. Many people believe it caused this miracle. But here, we see in this town here, instead of believing in the gospel, they think Paul and Barnabas are God sent down from heaven. And they begin to worship them, led by a false priest. Now, some people, some charlatans would have been, oh, man, this is awesome. I have hit the jackpot today. But Barnabas and Paul, in verse 14, tore their robes when they heard this and rushed into the crowd shouting, people, why are you doing these things? We are people also just like you and we are proclaiming good news to you that you should turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to go their own way, although he did not leave himself without a witness since he did what is good by giving you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons and filling you with food in your heart to joy. Even though they said these things, they barely stopped the crowd from sacrificing to them. This is how, this is how embedded false teaching was in these people's hearts. A false religion, folks. Religion will send you straight to hell. Religion will not save you. The gospel is not religion. The gospel is a life-changing experience when God gives you the faith to believe the gospel and he transforms your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what it is. It's not a religion because religion will send you to hell. That's what happens. That's where these people were going because they believed in a religion. A religion that's most likely dead today, and they are too. We find Paul and Barnabas, what do they do? They can't bring these people. This is what the law says. No, they bring them to creation. These people are so embedded in nature. They're so embedded in I hate the term Mother Nature. Do you know that? Anytime I hear a weather person say that, I almost want to blow up, just just explode on the spot. There is no Mother Nature. I can tell you there's no uh, certain bunnies either. I can also tell you there's no dude that dresses in a red suit, but I won't go no farther than that for the kids' sake, right? Mm. But I get infuriated at this. God has created everything for us to know that He exists. He created the sun to magnify His glory, His power, His brightness. He created the moon to give us light at night, also to remind us that He is in control. Without the moon there, oh man, our earth would be in terrible shape. The moon is placed exactly where it needs to be by the power of God to bring in the tides, to bring in the seasons. It's it's amazing what God has done in creation to magnify His glorious name. He is even... Esther asked me about pollen the other day. I had to explain to her what pollen was in such a long, detailed... I had to do a sermon on pollen to her, okay? Uh, And it was a a long, drawn-out experience how God uses it now to make things grow. Someday, pollen won't make us sick in heaven any longer. But now when you see your car is black and you see it's actually yellow, you know it's pollen season, right? That's what it is. Know this, it's part of God's creation that's keeping things alive. As he says here, he gives you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling you with food and your hearts with joy. You take the pollen out of this area and everything is going to die. What you going to eat? 
Huh? What are you going to eat when everything's dead? It's God that keeps all this together. These people had no clue. And Paul and Barnabas, with their signs and wonders, try to draw them out of this false religion. The gospel has results. Unity and division, signs and wonders. Why don't we see signs and wonders today? I'm going to tell you today, I think we see the signs and wonders and we miss them. I think we're just, they're there. Let me remind you, God has not changed. Does God need to heal those who are lame from birth to help us to know that he's real, not changed? He doesn't need to do that. I know he's not changed. I know he's real. Can God still heal those who've been lame from birth to walk again? Yeah. Or to walk for the first time? Oh, yes, he sure can. Can he give sight to the blind who've never seen? Oh, yes, he sure can. Maybe our prayers, maybe we limit our prayers. Maybe we're like the apostles when they couldn't cast out the demon. And Jesus said, you got little faith. Your faith's too small. Let it grow. Maybe our faith's too weak for the signs and wonders. And we need to ask for God to increase our faith for the signs and wonders. The gospel's not changed. Neither is God, neither has his power. The signs and wonders, I believe, are still available if you ask God for them. Then lastly, after this, verse 19, some Jews, unbelieving Jews, came from Antioch and Iconium. Now, do you see how these, they're following Paul and Barnabas now. They're following them. Opposition is always following when God's at work. Some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and when they won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city thinking he was dead. Now, I'm going to know I'm in trouble if I show up one Sunday morning and y'all got rocks in your hands when I come in. If that happens, if that happens, I ain't coming in. Okay? I know what's in front of me, so I won't come in. As Jesus was persecuted, so were the apostles. He told them it happened. He told them it would. You're going to be persecuted. Persecution against believers is on the rise now. We see it. The gospel, though, and the signs and wonders should have been enough for the people of Iconium, Lister, and Derby to believe in Jesus and the gospel, but not everybody believed. Why? Why didn't Pharaoh let the children of Israel go before his son died? You ever thought of that? At one point in time, Pharaoh's chief advisors came to him after about seven or eight plagues and told us, Egypt is ruined. It's ruined. Hailstones mixed with fire, the, the locust plague ate everything up. All, our, our country's ruined. Just let him go. And he wouldn't do it. He would not believe. His heart was so hard, it took God taking that man's son from him to let the children of Israel go. Some people are hard-hearted, and I have no idea why. Why it was not enough for these people to see what was happening, what was being said, not to believe. Here's where we are, though, in our society. Here's where we are. Our society says there, there can be a God. That's fine. They'll let you have God. But he is okay with us doing anything we want to do. Which reminds me exactly what happened in the book of Judges to the children of Israel. There was no king over the land of Israel. Remember, God told, God told them that and more or less that I'm your king, but when you get there and you get established, I'll give you a king. You, when you want a king, I'll give you one. You ask me for one who's not like all the other kings around you, but one that I will appoint to you, I'll give you one who will lead you. And he gave within that law of Moses to, that the king, when they got one, was to take the law of God and make a copy for himself and to study it himself so that he would know God's law and lead his people in the right way. That's what God said when you got a king. But we find in the book of Judges, this, this phrase is littered throughout that chap, those books, that chapter, those chapters of that book. Excuse me, I'll get out in a minute. There was no king in Israel. Everybody did what they thought was right in their own sight. Folks, that is where we are now. 
If someone thinks it's right to take Chuck's boots off and, and make, your, make his boots yours, then that's right with them. If somebody says, well, I think I'll, some guy says, I'll be a woman today, guess what? It's right in his eyes, but it's not right in God's eyes. It's not. This is where we are because the gospel has had results in drawing people to faith, but it's also had results in drawing people away from God. It's not the gospel's fault. It's not God's fault. They don't want to admit that they're wrong. They don't want to, they won't, they don't want to give up their sin. That's the issue. They don't want to let go of their sin. Sin is so great, and they love it, and they don't want to let go of it. These people did not want to let go of their false religion. This priest of Zeus, I don't know who he was. Don't, he doesn't give his name or anything. It mentioned that his, his, temp, his temple was outside the city. I bet this was going to be the greatest sacrifice he'd ever made, though. Because he knew, he knew finally that Zeus had come down to his empty temple. But it wasn't Zeus who had come down. It was God who had showed up in town in the form of the gospel through Jesus Christ by Paul and Barnabas. What else did they need to believe? What else did they need? A few questions I've got through this. Is are you united in faith or are you divided by unbelief? Are you united in faith in Christ or are you divided by unbelief? How would you react today to an actual, well, I shouldn't say actual, but to a miracle? That's, I think we've seen them, we've just missed them. How would you react, though, if we had somebody in here who was sick, lame, or whatever, and suddenly was healed at some point in time in their life? How would you react to that? Do you need, are you like Thomas? Do you need to see, do you need to actually see the hole in Jesus' side or touch the, hand, the holes in his hands and wrists? Do you need to actually see those to actually believe? Do you need to see that burning bush that God gave Moses before you'll believe? Do you need to see that? What else do you need to believe? What else, what else is there that God needs to do to make you believe? Notice I didn't say that I need to do to make you believe. It is not me that makes you believe. Every, every other religion, and I know we have to, I, I know I spoke that religion sends you to hell. Christianity is religion. I know this is the term. I don't like to use the term. But we have to, okay? Every other faith-based whatever, the teachers have to make the people believe what is being said. Or else, those people are not followers. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you don't pray in Aramaic, Muslim, Islam, if you don't pray a certain way, certain times of the day, certain prayers, you are not a full follower of that religion. Folks, I want to tell you something today. I can't make you believe in Jesus. I can't make you follow Jesus. I can't speak enough. I can't preach enough. I can't teach enough to make you do anything for God. All I can do is tell you what God's Word says, and then He makes you do it. Or better yet, He gives you the desire to do it. He gives you the want to to do it. He gives you the purpose to do it. He gives you the love to do it, you see? I don't make you do anything. God draws you to do it because you find it a joy to do. Notice Paul says that God has given you rain from heaven, fruitful seasons filling you with food and your hearts with joy. God's done this for you, he said. Why do you want to do this other stuff? Verse 20, come to a close. After the disciples gathered around him, 
He got up and went to the town. The next day he left with Barnabas for Derby. This dude just been stoned. They thought he was dead. You know, they drug him out of the city and left him. You know, left him. The apostles kind of had, evidently had, stayed, had to stay back from the mob. When they left him, he went on. He wasn't dead. He was very much alive. <laughs> it looked like he was dead, but he, wasn't very, he was very much alive. What do you do? The persecution. Evangelism continued. So did the persecution. But always throughout this, Paul and Barnabas were reminded that God had already warned them, you're going to be persecuted. If they hate me, he said, Jesus said, they'll hate you. But blessed are those who are persecuting. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Are you willing? Are you prepared to be persecuted for the name of Jesus Christ? Well, I don't know. I don't think I like that, Paul. I, don't, I like the joy part. I don't like the persecution part. Who would? Who wants to be persecuted? Who wants to be? Nobody does. Let me remind you. Let me remind you. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Jesus Christ lives inside of you. He abides with you as believers. You can handle anything with him. But you can fall for anything without him. If you put your trust in Jesus, he may take you through a time of persecution. He may do it. But if he does, he will be with you the entire way. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, that priest or whatever of Zeus, that man, I, I don't know how many people that man had led to worshiping Zeus and Hermes. But every one of those who believed in Zeus and Hermes found out in the end, if they didn't meet Jesus, they found out in the end that Zeus and Hermes cannot help them. There's no other God. There's no other name. There's no other person other than Jesus Christ that will take you from this life into glory. And the only way you can get there is through Jesus Christ. Every other way is death. Every other way is torment. Every other way is sadness and loneliness and the lack of joy and the lack of love. Will you trust in Jesus today if you haven't? If you have, if you have, pray for unity, pray for the gospel to spread, pray for strength to get through the persecution. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, as your son Jesus was persecuted, so are many believers today. And so are we at times, and so will we be at times. But God, you're with us in the persecution. You're with us in the trials, as you were Paul and Barnabas. You didn't allow them to kill him. You weren't done with him. And God, I fully believe and I am fully persuaded that until you're done with us, nothing's going to happen to us. Now, that's not a license for us to sin. That's not a license for us to do whatever we want to. As long as we are in your will, Father, and as long as you have a purpose for us, nobody can touch us because we are secure in the hands of Jesus. And even when you are done with us, and even when our ministry comes to an end, and if someone takes our life, they're not taking our lives. They're not taking it. We're just offering it up to you, Father. Because we know that to be absent in this body is to be present for you. Father, bless today. If there's anybody here lost, I know this may not be a message. Well, I want to sign up for persecution. Father, your word doesn't go out to you void. Father, we don't want people to live in unbelief. We don't want people to believe every whip snitch of a, of a, of a religious talk, religious message. We want people just to simply believe in Jesus Christ. That he is your son. He died on the cross and he rose again from the dead. That will get them. That will get them. If they believe that and you give them the faith to believe, that will get them from this life to eternity. Oh, but God, there's so much more. And thank you that there is so much more. And we give you the praise and glory in Christ's name. And amen.